Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Theoretical and Computational Physics weekly seminar. Today, it is a pleasure to welcome Halim Kusuma Atmaja from the Department of Physics at the University of Durham. Halim did his uh, doctorate with Julia Yeomans at Oxford, then he was a postdoc in Germany, then in uh, Cambridge, and then he uh, joined the uh, uh, faculty at Durham a few years ago. And today he's very kindly agreed to tell us about modeling ternary fluid flows using uh, lattice Boltzmann methods, which is a, a technique that some of us uh, also use. So this should be a very lively uh, seminar. This uh, seminar will be uh, recorded. So by staying on, you're giving consent to your image and voice being uh, recorded. So, and um, I think this is all from me and I'll hand over to Halim now. Can I ask everybody to keep your microphones muted and your cameras switched off during the seminar, except the speaker, of course. You are, of course, free to turn them back on and ask questions uh, whenever you like. Okay, so it's over to you, Halim. Right, so I hope you can uh, hear me clearly. So um, thank you very much uh, to Paolo uh, for the invitation. So it's a pleasure for me to give this talk. So as Paolo said, I thought it would be nice to tell you about some of our recent works on modeling ternary fluid flows using uh, lattice Boltzmann method. Uh, so this is the, the plan for, uh, for today. Um, so first I will uh, share with you some uh, examples to motivate why ternary fluid or more phases are interesting. So uh, typically when people are dealing with uh, multi-phase, multi-component, you're just dealing with uh, you know, two phases or two components. And I'll tell you about the free energy model that we are using. And then um, I will follow by giving you three examples of applications where we have exploited this LBM approach to look at ternary fluid flows. Um, so depending on time, I may not be able to finish everything, uh, but I hope I will get uh, to the end. So uh, yeah, uh, to, to get started, let me show you uh, some motivation why uh, ternary fluid flows are interesting. So one area where um, it could be interesting is to look at a collision of droplets. Uh, rather than two droplets which are of the same material, we can also look at problems where the droplets are immiscible. So this has uh, relevance in aerosols, um, in uh, combustion, and basically in many other applications like emulsions as well. So what is quite interesting is that depending on the surface properties, the surface tensions and viscosities and things like that, if you actually collide these droplets, they can have uh, multiple outcomes, including um, uh, this one, this is actually bouncing. You can get uh, droplet encapsulation. You can also get uh, droplet adhesion. So I'll show you uh, some of our work that try to replicate this. Uh, another uh, uh, motivation that is actually quite uh, major in my group is the idea of um, liquid infused surfaces. Um, so if you haven't seen this before, these are pitcher plants. They are carnivorous plants that actually eat insects. So I'm going to show you two movies, one when the environment is dry and the other one is when the environment is wet. So the, the, you know, the movie is about exactly the same, uh, the same pitcher plant. So this is when uh, the environment is dry. So you see that the ants are quite happy. It can just walk uh, around nicely. And this is what happens when the environment is wet. So like in England, it's always wet. So this is uh, typically what happens. Um, the surface becomes very slippery. And this is in fact the mechanism for the plants to basically get its meals. Now, uh, this, this kind of super slippery surfaces are interesting for engineering and industrial applications. So uh, we are in England. So as you know, we, uh, we eat a lot of uh, ketchup. And then you typically see this, that at the end of the uh, lifetime of the product, you will struggle to actually get uh, things out uh, because there's a lot of friction uh, between your liquid and the, the solid surface. But you can probably imagine if you have a super slippery material, a super slippery surface, then this can be uh, overcome quite, uh, quite nicely, quite easily. So for the purpose of the talk later on, uh, this actually corresponds to three uh, fluids because you have, let's say, the liquid that you're interested in. So in this cartoon is the water droplet. And you also have what we call the lubricant, typically an oil. Um, this is actually a second liquid. And then the third fluid is actually the surrounding gas. Okay, so this is the sort of geometry that we will be thinking of when we're trying to uh, biomimic this uh, picture plant. 
Um, third example, I'm not going to tell you uh, too much about it in the talk, but just to show you some pretty movies uh, of what we have done in this direction. So these are just uh, movies of phase separation if you're just varying the composition of the, uh, the three fluids. Uh, and then depending on the composition, you get something that look like, you know, old uh, glass window pane that you see in churches. Um, you get uh, actually a double quench, you, you get the first sminodal. And then the droplet is still a mix of basically two fluids. And then you get a second quench, so you get a second spinodal. And this is basically uh, where you get uh, the, 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 the three uh, fluids. Um, and then um, another two examples, I'm going to play them simultaneously, would be the case where this one looks a lot more like a binary uh, phase separation, the one in the bottom left, except the third fluid creeps up and then form basically small droplets surrounding it. And then the final example, Okay, I'm sorry if the final example doesn't seem to play, but uh, this is the case where it's a bit similar to the top right, except the blue is the minority in comparison to the mixture of green and red. And then the, the fourth motivation, I'm going to say a little bit more later on, is to look at uh, droplet macrofluidics, in particular, how you can generate double emulsion. So uh, droplets uh, within droplets. And if you're not familiar, microfluidics uh, have been exploited in, in many areas uh, including in, in biosystem, for example, to encapsulate uh, cells or, you know, bacteria. You also use this to, to generate uh, emulsions in your, uh, in your everyday product, for example. So I hope I've convinced you at this point that there are many uh, problems that we can investigate if we have a good method uh, to look at ternary fluid flows. And then the approach that I'm taking in my group is to use the lattice Boltzmann method. Uh, so I learned that this is also something that uh, many people in uh, in Lisbon uh, are using. So if we're thinking about multi-phase, multi-component flow, the first challenge that we need to uh, to come up with is to basically ask the question, how do we introduce multiple fluid components, not just two? So here we are interested in three, and in principle, the approach I'm describing can be extended to uh, four or five or however many um, phases or components if you're interested to do so. And in Lattice Boltzmann, there are several known approaches for multi-phase, multi-component LBM. Uh, and the one that I'm going to use is the free energy uh, model. And this is basically a, a cousin of the phase field model. So they are very similar. And then the macroscopic equations that we are solving at the end of the day correspond to the uh, continuity and the Navier-Stokes equations for the general fluid dynamics. But because we have multiple fluid components, we're also going to solve the kahn hilliard equation. So if you have a two component system, typically there is one kahn hilliard equation. But if we have three, for example, typically we then do two kahn hilliard equations because we have uh, you know, different interfaces. Let me uh, start with the simplest model where the density is the same uh, throughout the whole fluids. So this would be good if, for example, uh, the different materials you have are all liquids rather than some liquid, some gas. So in this case, um, as you probably have seen uh, in, in previous uh, free energy model in LBM, uh, we typically introduce a double well potential, but because we have three fluids, uh, one generalization is to introduce three double well potential. And each of them looks like that with a minimum uh, when the component, let's say if we look at C1, when C1 is zero, and when C1 is one. So this basically tells us uh, there is a bulk fluid where uh, the component is not present or it's present. And then by introducing three of them, I can actually capture basically three bulk fluids corresponding to uh, you know, material A, B, and C. And then to capture the physics of surface tension, I'm also introducing this gradient terms, uh, but because we have three components, we will actually introduce three terms uh, corresponding to the gradient of C1, C2, and C3. And this model is actually uh, really uh, nice because uh, if we then transform this to uh, rather than C1, C2, and C3, but in terms of the density, which is just one everywhere in our model, and then take two order parameters. Uh, so in this case, I take the first one is C1 minus C2, and then uh, the second one is Psi corresponding to C3, but you can do different uh, combinations if you like. You end up essentially with uh, a model where there are three minima, and the three minima correspond to the three uh, bulk fluids that you have. The model also has a nice feature that uh, because uh, this is a very simple double well uh, uh, basically form, uh, you can actually define what is the interface width. This will just be alpha in our formulation. 
and the surface tension between the different uh, permutations uh, of the interfaces, uh, they also have an analytical form. So it has this simple analytical form that depends on our value of kappa. So we can really tune uh, how much the surface tension is going to be between any interface. So we can do a, a benchmark. Uh, so a good benchmark uh, for this kind of model would be to look at Neumann triangle. So one possibility is to put a droplet at the interface between two fluids, uh, something like this. And then you can measure the Neumann uh, angle. And then by simple force balance, if you know the surface tension, you can actually figure out what those angles should be. And as you see, there's a really good agreement between the simulation and the experiment. You can also uh, look at a slightly different geometry where you have this sort of like uh, Janus droplet. Uh, so you can do the same thing. You can look at the force balance and similarly we get good agreement. The other thing that uh, we're going to need to introduce is the idea of wetting, so contact angle. So there are actually three uh, approaches that uh, we have thought about, uh, at least in, the, in our group. So the first one is to stay with the energy formulation and then you can introduce uh, free energy terms between the surface and the fluid. The simplest one is a linear term. Uh, so this is, uh, for example, uh, an example of the result. So if you are interested in moderate contact angle, this is uh, good enough. But if you want to go to very low contact angle or very high contact angle, usually the linear formulation is actually quite uh, poor. So the cubic term uh, has the same idea, but you have uh, basically cubic formulation in terms of the power of C1. Uh, so that actually works better. Uh, we can also uh, introduce forcing terms between the solid and the fluid. So this will be very similar to Shan Chen type approach. And the other one that would be quite uh, useful is actually the geometric boundary condition. So this paper um, does a bit of comparison between the forcing and the geometric uh, boundary condition, for example. So <clears throat> that's basically uh, all we need if we want to do uh, uh, uniform density. But of course, in some applications, we want to make sure that there is a density ratio between the, the liquid and the gas uh, components. So if you just do the standard lattice Boltzmann, unfortunately, it won't be stable. So you typically get uh, instability. And uh, for binary systems, there are multiple uh, approaches that people have proposed. So in our work, we actually uh, take advantage of this entropic scheme. Um, I think Ilya Karlin is one of the, the people that really push uh, this idea of entropic lattice Boltzmann. And what I'm going to tell you now is how we are coupling uh, the idea of free energy approach and the entropic scheme. So if we want to uh, carry out simulations where there's a density uh, ratio, between the, you know, between the components, we can do that in a free energy approach. So this is just one way of doing it. So if you look at uh, the equation that I show here uh, on the screen, uh, let's concentrate first on the first term here. So here you can actually take the free energy for any equation of state that you might be interested in. So this could be, uh, you know, something like Karna and Sterling, it could be van der Waals, it could be Fang Robinson, uh, whatever your favorite uh, equation of state is, and then you turn that into a free energy. So if you just have that, and people have done this, typically you will have a, a free energy where there is a minimum over here corresponding to the gas density. And there is also another minimum uh, over here at the, at the top where it corresponds to the density of the liquid, right? So that is typically what we call a multi-phase uh, model um, with some equation of state. So the idea that we have is actually very simple. So if we, have, if we want to have three fluids and then they will have, let's say different densities, we exploit this term that will give us uh, basically the different densities, but we do not want uh, just basically one uh, liquid, but we also want to say create two different liquids here. So we add additional terms corresponding to double well potentials that basically create this two minima where I have my two liquids and then the original minimum that would be a minim, you know, that would be the case for a multi-phase system that would actually become like a subtle point. So if you look at this uh, picture, the idea is very simple. You come up with a free energy model where you have minima at the relevant densities and also order parameters, right? So in this case, we have this order parameter that tells us whether we have one liquid or the other. So uh, once uh, we have this, uh, the other thing uh, that we have done, the simplification is to make sure that to make the, uh, in a sense, the coexistence curve uh, much simpler in terms of Gibbs criterion and so forth, 
we basically adjust the uh, the free energy uh, for this equation of state such that the uh, the base of the minima are basically on the same plane. You don't have to do this, but this makes it a little bit uh, simpler in terms of uh, formulation. So that's just the bulk free energy that tells us there will be three minima corresponding to one gas and two liquid. Uh, so similar to before, we need the surface tension term. Again, we introduce uh, basically square gradient terms. Uh, so this can be written in terms of rho or the two uh, liquid components, but better, this can be written in terms of the density and the order parameter, but we have also the coupling between the, uh, the density and the order parameter. And once you're at this point, if you are familiar with a free energy model, then uh, you know, it's actually quite standard. You can uh, derive the, uh, the chemical potential, which is the functional derivative with respect to the density and the order parameter. Um, that enters the kahn hilliard equation for the order parameter. It also enters the Navier-Stokes equation either through the pressure tensor or through the forcing term. So it depends on how you do this in Lattice-Boltzmann. Um, maybe a, a small word to say about the entropic scheme. So uh, we really need the entropic scheme to make the simulation stable. So if you look at this equation here, so apologies for the non-expert uh, in Lattice-Boltzmann, but if you have used Lattice-Boltzmann before, this term is just a forcing term. And in this case, we have taken the exact difference method. And the key difference between the entropic scheme uh, with the standard LBM is that typically uh, in standard LBM, this alpha is just a constant. So in this formulation, it will be a number two. Uh, but in entropic LBM, alpha is actually a solution of this uh, non-trivial uh, uh, implicit equation. And the key idea here, I don't want to go into much details, is to make sure that uh, entropy is always increasing, or at least it's not decreasing. And this translates to, uh, to the Boltzmann H function. And in that language, it's a non-increasing uh, discretized H function. So that's what we need for the uh, distribution functions in lattice Boltzmann for the density. But for the order parameter, we can just use the, the, the standard uh, D3Q19 or uh, you know, the standard one that you typically use. Okay, so um, I'm basically uh, going really fast uh, for the method because I want to get to the applications, but please ask me if anything is unclear uh, later on. Uh, so uh, as before, we also did some benchmark. So uh, for example, we do Laplace pressure tests to make sure that uh, everything is okay and then we can capture the surface tension. Uh, we also show that uh, it works for different uh, equation of states. And then if you uh, spot here, uh, at the low temperature, we can get density ratio, which is quite high. Typically, it's possible to get uh, density ratio, which is several hundreds and even uh, maybe low thousands, so like a thousand or two thousand. That's actually possible uh, with this approach. Um, yeah, so this is the Neumann triangle uh, test. So it's the same as before, but we just repeat it for the high density model. Okay, so I'm going to uh, look at applications now. And the first application that I'm going to, to do is uh, the idea of uh, droplet collision. So in particular, when the droplets are immiscible. So typically um, it would look uh, something like this, where I have two droplets, uh, the red and the, uh, the gray droplets, and then I'm basically giving them some initial velocity and they are going to collide. So in this case, this is what happens when the, uh, the droplets have uh, equal super surface tension. So they are symmetric. So when the velocity is high, as you can see here, they will come and they will basically uh, bounce off each other. But if you uh, give them a you know, small velocity, you will see that um, uh, the kinetic energy is not enough to, uh, to overcome the adhesion between the two droplets. So they actually uh, come together. Uh, and what is quite fun is what, what happens when the uh, surface tension is not uh, symmetric. Uh, so this is actually a very asymmetric case. Uh, so in this case, if I do the same um, computer experiment, you will see that uh, they will come together and basically uh, they almost, uh, uh, you know, uh, being encapsulated the, the red droplet, uh, but it's not quite there, right? So uh, let me show you the, the 2D cut just to see um, what, what happens. Okay, so thermodynamically, we are actually in a region where um, this uh, Neumann triangle still wants to be uh, satisfied. So encapsulation should not be there. But uh, the nice thing about Lattice-Boltzmann, of course, is that we can uh, look at dynamic effects. 
So what I'm going to show you now is what happens when the velocity of the droplets are actually higher. So in this case, you can actually get uh, encapsulation of the red droplet. And as you see, the oscillation of the droplet is actually helping uh, the encapsulation uh, process. So let me now play this movie. It's the same movie, except this is just uh, the, the 2D cut. So you see there's an oscillation and the contact line actually creeps up and eventually they will actually meet together, they coalesce and you get this, this encapsulation. Okay, now the second uh, example I want to show you is our work on liquid infused uh, surfaces. Um, so let me remind you what is the typical geometry that uh, we're interested in. So we are typically uh, thinking about uh, a water droplet and then there is a lubricant uh, and then there's a surrounding gas. And because of capillary effects, the lubricant will get lifted. It will get basically pulled by the surface tension of the water gas. And then you get this kind of geometry. And depending on the contact angle, we can actually get very different uh, morphologies depending on whether the, the water droplet is imbibing the corrugation. And similarly, whether the, the gas is also um, uh, in contact or not with the, uh, with the surface. So, um, in this uh, talk, I'm going to focus on this case where we essentially have partial wetting uh, with regards of the lubricant uh, related to the droplet and also to the gas. In other words, there is a finite contact angle over here for the, um, the water oil surface and also a finite contact angle between the oil gas surface. Uh, so that's basically the case that, um, that we're going to focus on. And then uh, the first question I'm asking uh, in this talk is, okay, if we have this kind of geometry, what is actually the right contact angle to think about when we have a droplet on a liquid infused surface? Because you can probably imagine this is uh, much more complicated uh, compared to standard wetting because I have this contact angle, I have that contact angle, I also have this uh, Neumann triangle. So we propose that uh, this is probably the right one to use. Uh, we call this the apparent contact angle because uh, in the majority of the experiments, the, uh, the lubricant meniscus or the oil meniscus here is quite small. So if you observe this using microscopy, this is actually the angle that you typically will observe in your experiment. So what is actually quite interesting uh, in this system is that as it turns out, the apparent angle is going to depend on the size of the uh, oil meniscus, or in other words, uh, on the different uh, pressure, uh, Laplace pressure ratios. So this is actually a simulation that we have done uh, where we are comparing the data from our lattice Boltzmann simulation compared to analytical expressions that we have derived uh, previously uh, ourselves. So we basically have the base equation where we say the meniscus is basically very small, uh, but we also have the full solution where we take into account the finite size and therefore the different Laplace pressure ratio. And as you can see, uh, if we take the, the, the proper solution, uh, there's a good agreement between the, uh, the analytical model and then the simulation. Okay, so this tells us that we can actually capture wetting very well on wetting on liquid infused surfaces. So the fun uh, question I want to ask now is what happens if I put a droplet on a liquid infused surface, but now, the surface texture has some gradient. And the question is whether it's going to move to the right where the solid fraction is larger, or is it actually going to move to the left where the solid fraction is smaller? So this is actually uh, not so simple, but uh, before I answer my own question, let me uh, tell you what people have done uh, with wet ingredients. Uh, so this has attracted many attention because of potential applications in uh, droplet manipulations in microfluidics and water harvesting and other uh, cases. So the, the first example is uh, to do with chemical gradient. So this goes all the way to white sites, for example, uh, where he showed that if you have chemical gradient, you can push a droplet to move uphill against gravity. Uh, so David Kere has also done the case for um, superhydrophobic surface where uh, he has different uh, basically surface texture and he sees that the droplet is moving. So typically it's moving to uh, the case where the, uh, the solid fraction is higher. And there's also this light and frost uh, droplet where uh, you see this uh, in your kitchen if you have very hot plate and you put a liquid droplet they're just going to move around 
and by putting um, basically some ratchet structure, you can actually drive it to move in a certain direction. But what is important to emphasize is that in all these examples, they always move in one specific direction. And what is really uh, quite cute uh, for uh, the liquid and free surface case is that we just showed that it can actually move in either direction. And to think about this, uh, there's a simple analytical uh, model to describe it. So think about the foot of the droplet. So uh, look at the, the oil manuscus there. Uh, so what I want to do now is to look at uh, force balance um, uh, at, the, uh, at the oil manuscus. So um, let me first focus on the inner meniscus. So basically the water oil surface uh, contact line. And if I look at the force balance, uh, then I can basically take um, this contribution here, which is the effective surface tension force between the oil and the composite substrate, which is the oil and the, the solid surface. And I get basically something that looks like that. I can also look at the uh, contribution from the uh, effective surface tension between water and the composite substrate. I can do the same thing for the outer meniscus. And if I sum uh, that together and I do a bit of algebra, what is nice is that I can actually get a driving force that depends on the detail of the uh, corrugation uh, within this integral. But as a prefactor, I get a term that looks like minus, sorry, that looks like cos theta solid minus cos theta lubricant. So essentially, there is a prefactor that basically tells us cos theta solid is how the droplet likes to wet the solid, and cos theta lubricant tells us how much the droplet likes to wet the lubricant. And this term can be positive or negative depending on whether the, uh, the water droplet likes the lubricant more or the solid more. And depending on the sign, it can move in either direction. So uh, we've done simulations and also experiments. So this is one example where we put, uh, for example, uh, water droplet on diidomethane lubricant and the solid surface is actually the same. And if we uh, put this, uh, it actually uh, moves uh, to the denser solid area. If we do the same experiment, except we swap uh, either the droplet or the lubricant. So in the experiment, we swap the, the lubricant. So we now do water droplet on FC70 lubricant. Uh, we do exactly the same thing we see that the droplet is moving to the left, the sparser uh, solid area. And as I said before, we can swap the, the droplet, the lubricant. In principle, you can also change the, uh, the solid surface, but this is a bit more complicated because you have to then generate new, uh, new patterning. Uh, we show that uh, this works for different kinds of uh, patterning, whether you have posts like that uh, or whether you have grooves. We've done uh, full 3D simulations. We have also done uh, quasi uh, 3D simulations where essentially we just take a row of posts. Um, and then we've also done simulation and experiments. So you might ask, okay, this is nice, but is there any application you can think of? So uh, an idea that we have is for drop sorting and drop binning. Uh, so for instance, if we couple this with gravity, the trajectory of the droplet will be driven uh, depending on the surface tension and wetting properties as well as the size. So we can actually sort them uh, based on two uh, properties, size and surface tension properties. If we discretize the, uh, the changes in the uh, patterning, you can actually bin them with a certain range. So this is an, an idea that we are trying to, uh, to push forward experimentally in collaboration with uh, Gary Wells and Glenn McHale uh, in, in Edinburgh at the moment. The final example I want to, to tell you uh, is related to uh, uh, microfluidics applications. Um, so um, this is droplet generation, double emulsion generation using microfluidics. But the first thing that we have to change uh, in this model uh, is to go back to our idea of this free energy, because if we take uh, this free energy model, this is all nice. Uh, and then you can predict the surface tension but the problem here is that if we want to have cases what you get when you get full encapsulation, for example, uh, the cases over here in the top left or the cases in the bottom left or the cases in the bottom right, within this free energy formulation that I have uh, written before, this actually necessitates the use of, uh, of a negative kappa. 
And this is actually not good because if you think about the double well potential, if you actually make kappa negative, this is going to uh, flip the, the, the shape of the curve uh, to look like something that I draw here in the blue curve. And that is really bad because that's going to make uh, your system unstable because the, the system can actually lower its free energy by just going to uh, the composition going to minus infinity or infinity. So your simulation will blow up. So the idea that we have introduced is that you can actually still use negative kappa, but only to capture the middle part here. But you need to add penalty terms or regulation terms to make sure that you actually cut this pieces that actually goes to infinity and add additional terms. So typically we use uh, something to the power of six or eight to make sure that um, it's still uh, well regulated. And then if you do that, uh, this is actually the results of the simulation where you can actually capture cases where uh, there is a surface tension balance um, at this three phase contact line between the red, green and blue liquid. So you have Neumann triangle you can also get cases where you get this full encapsulation. Okay, so um, let me now show you um, some simulations of droplet, uh, gen droplet generation using microfluidics where we change the surface tension. So this is what happens if you have uh, full wetting where the, um, the blue liquid is going to be fully encapsulated by the green one. So you can see actually nice regular pattern uh, forming. This is what happens if I change the surface tension balance between my liquids. I can get what I call the, you know, the, the Janus droplet. And then the last example that I'm going to show here is what happens when um, we have non-wetting case where um, the, the blue droplet really doesn't like the, um, uh, the, the green red interface. So you see that uh, the, the blue droplet gets expelled from the interface and you, you tend to get this, uh, you know, green droplet, blue droplet and so forth. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on this uh, full wetting case where you get this double emulsion. And this is uh, the geometry that uh, we're going to do. So um, it's very similar to what I showed you before, where you have uh, a, an inlet, which is the red liquid, two inlets, which are the green liquid, and then two inlets, which are the, uh, the blue liquid. Uh, and then if you're interested, um, we use the, uh, the Zohi uh, boundary condition for the inlet, so all inlets. And also for the outlet, uh, we use what we call the convective boundary condition which is essentially to let the system to just propagate uh, whatever that you have, you just basically propagate it out. Now, these are the typical pictures that we get that uh, reproduce what you typically see in experiments uh, for this kind of uh, double emulsion generation. You can get um, uh, an emulsion where there are basically two pinch off. So you can see that here in the first picture, the red droplet first get pinch off and together the green liquid gets pinched off. But you can also get cases where the emulsion is formed by the whole thing being pinched off uh, at the same time. So uh, the whole thing here, the neck, the composite neck between the uh, red, green, and blue liquid, they basically pinch off together. Uh, we also get cases where you get a uh, filled droplet and empty droplet, and you get more complicated behavior. Um, so it's a bit like a chaotic behavior in terms of uh, how you see the droplets being formed. So we've done uh, a systematic study uh, where we vary the capillary numbers uh, of the three inlet, so the, uh, the three liquids that we have. And we can actually come up with this uh, rich phase diagram uh, where we show that there are a variety of morphologies that you can form just by changing um, the, the flow rate and this is just a small piece of what can be done. And also I think this is the reason why experimentally uh, doing microfluidics is very useful, but actually it's quite tricky to tune the, um, uh, to tune the, uh, the operating procedure because here we just change the, um, the flow rate, but you can also play with the surface tension, you can play with the geometry and so forth. And because we wanted to have a systematic study, we only limit ourselves to 2D simulations, so we can do 3D 
uh, but we didn't do that because otherwise we wouldn't be able to do this uh, this phase diagram. So we get this uh, different behavior, and just to uh, make the point that uh, we can actually link this to experiment, uh, this is just a list where um, there are different experimental papers that have proposed basically the different regimes that we saw in the simulation. And what is nice is that essentially we can see all of these in the simulation, and it really depends on where you are in the operating uh, procedure of your microfluidics device. So um, the other thing that we can do, because we have systematic data like this, um, is that we can look at the size variation. So we can look at how the size of the droplet depends on the different flow rates. We can also look at the size ratio between the inner droplet and the outer droplet. So we can actually look at all of those. Uh, and then we can come up with some, um, basically some scaling law uh, to look at um, their behavior. So at the moment, um, this is uh, just based on intuition that we believe it should depend on the, uh, for example, on, on the, the volume ratio that basically flow uh, in the device. And we also think it should depend on the Capri number in a certain way. Um, however, we still don't have a good theory to basically say why the prefactor or the, the power law has to be a certain number. So at the moment, this is just a, a fitting exercise. Uh, but what is actually quite nice is that um, we actually take the form of the scaling law, uh, though the power is a little bit different, and we actually take this uh, form of the scaling law to experiments that are now done in a group uh, in Stanford, so poly 4 this lab. And as it turns out, actually the scaling law that we see in the simulation is also quite close to what they see in experiment, even though the, the prefactor and the power law is, 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 is a bit different, but the form actually looks quite, quite similar. So that's actually uh, all I want to, to say. So I think I'm probably a little bit uh, faster. Um, um, so I hope uh, I have uh, convinced you, I have shown you that uh, LBM is actually a nice versatile method if you want to look at multi-phase and multi-component flow. So uh, the, th the key physics you have to capture if you want to develop your own approach to, to do this problem, you need to capture the uh, Neumann triangle. You also need to capture the wetting contact angle. And then nice things we have done here is that uh, we can do high density ratio. Uh, and you know, if you're doing lattice Boltzmann that one of the advantage of lattice Boltzmann is that complex boundary condition is possible. Um, and then I've shown you three examples um, in droplet collision liquid infused surfaces, droplet microfluidics, and a bit of uh, phase separation. Uh, but there are really, I think, many other examples involving uh, ternary fluids that uh, we can now uh, solve. So with that, thank you very much for listening. And then if you have questions, then I'm happy to, uh, to answer. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, Halim, for a splendid talk. And I'm sure there will be some questions now. So if you want to ask a question, just raise the little blue hand. If you don't know how to raise the little blue hand, just fire off your question. Uh, don't forget to unmute yourself before asking your question. May I? Sure, go ahead. So hi, Hali. Uh, thank you very much for your <coughs> interesting talk. And by the way, we like very much the, the book you wrote of Jim Jim Kruger and, and others. Thank you. Uh, we use it quite often here. And um, well, my question is about the, the entropic lattice Boltzmann <clears throat> because uh, I don't have much experience with it. Uh, would you like to know the advantages uh, of using it in the multi component simulations? And um, if, if it's able to reduce the spurious velocities <clears throat> when simulating high density ratios? Yeah. So let me go back to that slide. <coughs> so the, the key difference um, in entropic LBM compared to the standard one, as I said, is actually this alpha prefactor, right? So if you do um, a standard BGK, uh, then alpha is just essentially a constant. It's, it's actually two in this formulation. And beta is the, the term that is related to the relaxation time. So the, the key advantage of the entropic is, 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 is as you said, is related to the stability because uh, if we run the same model and we just basically uh, fix alpha to be two, our simulation basically crash very quickly. 
And the problem, as you have indicated, is the spurious velocity um, at the interface. And often, actually, um, what happens is that if you initialize the system with high density ratio, there's going to be a relaxation of the shape of the interface. And this creates some sort of pressure wave. And if you have high density ratio, what typically happens is that these pressure waves go to the, um, to the, the gas region. And this kind of pushes the density of the gas to be something really close uh, to zero and sometimes even trying to push it to negative. And this is basically where it's game over. Your simulation is unstable. Uh, so what we notice with the uh, entropic uh, scheme is that because alpha is a variable, what it tends to, to happen is that it reduces the uh, spurious velocity at the interface. And it also effectively slows down the propagation of this, um, of this pressure wave a little bit. Um, because essentially, if you get anything that's you know, alpha different than the standard BGK one, you can also think of it as momentarily increasing the viscosity of the interface, right? So I think a combination of these two effects is basically why we get a much more stable uh, simulation uh, with high density. But you know, the entropic one, uh, the omplex scheme is not the only one. There are also other schemes that people have proposed. Uh, so the, the approach that is quite good um, in combination with free energy model will be the one by uh, Taihun Lee. So that's also uh, quite good. Um, and then the other approach that I see a lot of people are using uh, more and more these days is the cascaded uh, scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in all those cases, one thing I'm not entirely sure, uh, apart from Taihun Lee one, is that because essentially um, alpha is basically changing at the interface. What I'm not sure is that if you want to uh, look at problems where the interfacial viscosity is dominant in your problem, then I think you have to be extra careful there because the entropic scheme might it be you know, interfering with that. Thank but uh, from, for our purpose, where we're mostly interested in the bulk dynamics and then at the interface, what's important is just the surface tension, the entropic LBM is working really well. Good to know, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I have a question. Hello? Yeah, fire off. No longer blue hands in the uh, new Zoom. And uh, now we have green hands. No, uh, yellow hands or something. Uh, hello, Halim. Thank you very much for the talk. I have a question which always, um, I mean, how big are the droplets and how much uh, can you say, I mean, presumably they're microscopic, even from your uh, modeling, because if they're not macroscopic, then you would have to have something about miscibility or uh, thick uh, interfaces. So can you tell us something about the validity of the model for the uh, experiments and what is the absolute size of the range of the droplets? Because I, I think that this, this, this is something implicit in your modeling, but I may be wrong. So I'd like your comments on that. Yeah, so of course um, there is, uh, is, I guess there's a, a, a lower, limit because of, you know, you, you, you mentioned, um, in a sense, microscopic or mesoscopic effects, uh, but there is also an issue with the diffuse uh, interface, uh, the fact that we have a diffuse interface. And if you think about in reality, um, the, you know, the interface with in, in the real, let's say if you have a water droplet, the real interface is probably of the order of some nanometer, maybe let's say 10 nanometer. But in our modeling, this would be let's say at least three, four lattice spacings. And um, if you take the ratio of the interface width and the droplet, it would be much bigger um, in our modeling. So mm -hmm. the implicit assumption that we, we have to make is essentially the interface width has to be the smallest length scale if you want to capture macroscopic flow. And ideally the interface width should be uh, about an order of magnitude, at least smaller compared to the size of the droplet and any other important uh, length scale in your in your system. So mm -hmm. if I take, uh, let's say, uh, this sort of uh, problem, let me show you a typical example. Um, so this is not the one I've shown you before, but let's say, um, let's say this one, where I have a droplet moving across, uh, a, you know, a liquid infused surface. Um, the, the length scale that you probably care about is the, uh, the size of the droplet and also the corrugation. 
Mm -hmm. So typically we would have uh, an interface width, which is around, you know, three to four. And then the post uh, size is at least 10 or 15. And then the droplet, you can kind of see how many uh, lattice spacing uh, that is. So it's not quite an order of magnitude, every length scale, but that's big enough that it doesn't basically um, contaminate uh, the, uh, the problems in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a terrible way. So the results are still quite, quite good. So for example, we've done comparison with experiments and then the agreement is, is pretty reasonable. But in the experiments, the droplets are what, millimeters? So in the experiment, yeah, the droplet is typically, yeah, 100 microns or millimeters. You, you and then can... the post-spacing post would be, you know, some micrometer. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and is miscibility a problem at all? I mean, or you just don't care? I mean, if the fluids mix a little bit? Yeah, so uh, for our purpose, we, we don't really care. And in fact, we, uh, by design, we actually come up with uh, oh. free energy models that are immiscible. Uh, so these are, you know, immiscible system. Uh, but there are cases where, you know, miscibility is important. And in fact, maybe you want to have miscibility. So typically, uh, in the free energy approach, if you take like a double well potential, you always start by definition with an immiscible system. So if you want to have something which is miscible, you have to change the form of the free energy. But if you use something like Shan Chen, uh, that actually depends on your interaction parameter. So for weak interaction parameter, you actually get some miscibility. And in that case, you have to be a bit careful. If that's not the system you want to study, then you have to push your interaction parameter. Yeah, thank you. Okay. More questions, more comments, please. Who has questions, comments, criticism, praise, anything? Can I ask you something? Sure. So in this case where you have the two colliding drops, mm -hmm. um, you said that you need to increase the velocity in order to see it, but the arguments that you use to explain the final configuration, they are equilibrium arguments. So you don't need velocity at all. So how does it depend on velocity and how far can you go in terms of velocities when you try to simulate this collision between the droplets, in particular, if you are able to, to get to velocities where you start to see some splash of one fluid when it goes against the other. Thank you. Yeah, so good question. So maybe I wasn't clear in my description. So uh, maybe I, let me go back to this case here. Uh, so this is a phase diagram, <coughs> depending on the surface tension ratio. So if you are within this, um, this line, this uh, gray line, uh, thermodynamically, you're not going to get encapsulation or expulsion of droplets. Mm -hmm. But if you're outside this line, you would get that. So in the, the third example, the microfluidic one, I chose my parameters so that they are outside the, um, the, the, the gray line. So it's actually one of these. But in the first example, uh, where I show you about the droplet collision, Actually, I chose them to be inside the, uh, the, uh, the gray line, so just inside. So thermodynamically, it doesn't like to be encapsulated. So this is why uh, at low velocity, let me, yeah, let me play this. So this is why at low velocity, I hope it's the right movie I play. At low velocity, you see that at equilibrium uh, because of thermodynamics, it's almost encapsulated, but not quite, because we are still inside this gray line. But only because of dynamic effects, you can actually have enough kinetic energy to overcome this energy barrier because of the, uh, the surface tension. Uh, so this is uh, the case where we have to put in some kinetic energy. So if you wait the simulation long enough, then two things can happen. So if you have big enough droplets, then the red droplet will just be somewhere in the middle of the gray one, and it will just stay there. But if it's not deep enough into the gray droplet, then what often happens is that at some point it will then come back again and then sit at the interface because that's what thermodynamic dictates. Mm -hmm. but, but then if it uh, completely engulfs the, 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 the other particle, mm -hmm. then it's a metastable state, right? Yes. So, so in this case- From the point so of view, it should go back, but I don't see how that will happen in your simulations because you have nothing that 
that will force the, the fluid to go back, right? Yeah, so it's actually, um, it's actually dynamic. So uh, for example, if you have a, a red droplet, so, so we are we're basically, in this case, we're dynamically, it doesn't like to be uh, engulfed, right? So if the red droplet is really fast, what thing that, that can happen is that it penetrates the droplet and it goes to the other side. Um, and even uh, in that, so, so that's one case, that's the easy one to imagine. Mm -hmm. So in the other case where it is just enough to get encapsulated, what typically happens is that the droplet gets encapsulated, gets engulfed, but there is actually a recoil at the interface uh, of the of the gray interface and also at the uh, gray uh, red interface. Uh, there's a recall when the interface detaches and sometimes uh, the hydrodynamic interaction makes it that the uh, the droplet wants to come back to that interface. So we see this in the simulation. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. Or can, can I ask a comment? Uh, um, oh, no, I'll make a comment. I mean, if you're talking about droplets, of course, thermodynamics, proper thermodynamics, don't make sense because then you have to take the volume to infinity and there are no droplets. So you have to be very careful applying thermodynamic arguments to droplets and how they spread and, and so on. So I understand Nunu's question, but uh, I mean, most of these systems in, in, in reality, they're not really the thermodynamic stable in, in a way that the volume is, is finite. <laughs> Otherwise you wouldn't have a droplet. For example, if you put it on a surface, you'd never get uh, uh, the, the droplet on the surface. It would spread eventually, you'd have a microscopic film and so on and so forth. But um, yeah, droplets do exist and they, they are uh, sort of metastable in some sense, e even by themselves, and especially on, on the surface. They're not really the stable uh, microscopic film you'd expect in, in, in some, some sense. But, uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, maybe if you, if you go down that argument, then I guess I'm talking thermodynamics in the in a bit limited sense that there is finite volume and I'm thinking about the thermodynamics of the interfacial energies. So yeah, sure. I agree no, no, that- I understand what you're saying, but uh, there's a lot of confusion in the wetting literature and in, in surface literature as well, because you have to understand basically that sometimes what you're talking about is not some idealized, uh, I mean, if I want to make a droplet in a simulation, I have to make it, otherwise it just spreads, so, especially on the surface, it, it, it's very difficult to, uh, well, yeah, it's subtle. It's, it's, those limits have to be taken carefully. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um. Very good. Any more questions, comments? It seems not. So uh, can I just ask one very brief question, Kalim? When you mention that alpha parameter, that is not a constant in your in your method, but the solution of some uh, sorry about that the solution of some equation. This means that at every time step you have to solve the implicit equation for this alpha. Yes. Okay, which adds considerably to your computational overhead. I I, I got. Yeah, but um, typically this uh, this thing you have to do only. Um, at the interface. Right, okay. So yeah, it, it does add some, uh, some extra costs. Uh, so the way we do this is that uh, uh, by an iterative approach, uh, and typically we only need three to maybe five uh, iterations to get something uh, sensible. And we also have um, basically in, in our code, you know, some if statement that if you're far from the interface, don't bother essentially. Okay. Because it's just going to give us uh, essentially the constant that says that is the same in, in, in the standard LBM, the BGK approach. Okay, very good. Thank you. Well, any more questions now? Don't see any more raised hands. Don't think anybody wants to ask any more questions. So uh, let's wrap up. Thanks again to Halim for a fascinating seminar on the lattice Boltzmann method as applied to a class of our soft matter systems. Thanks to everybody for uh, listening and uh, we'll be back next week. Okay, Halim, goodbye, all Thank the you. best. See you all Thank next you. week. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye, Halim. Bye. Bye. Goodbye, Halim, keep safe. And everybody yeah, keep safe, keep, keep safe. Yeah, likewise. <laughs>
Nice to see you guys again. Bye bye for now. Well, thing is, uh, is, is, is will be a figure of speech now, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know what I mean. Yes. We've heard you, and we've yeah. seen you. We've seen you through the screen. That's the best we can do now. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.